So the Holy Spirit. That's what we've been talking about. We're working on that as we end May, as we walk into June. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit, a very narrow look at the Holy Spirit. And we established a couple things last week that carry over this week. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that with the Holy Spirit, God is at work in you. And the, the hope is, as we talk about that, that we, we understand that God is actually at work in you. That God is actually at the pool or wherever you are this summer. God is there by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we established uh, that the Holy Spirit is God last week. And this is the basics of the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit is alive and active and among us even today, even right now in this place. The Holy Spirit does not get relegated to some third tier of the Trinity in the sense of a hierarchy. We may talk about the Holy Spirit as a third person quite often, but that doesn't mean less than the first two persons of the Trinity. It's one God, not three God. The Spirit is with us right now. So uh, we talked last week about things that need to be exposed by the Spirit, those things that the Spirit works on in our own lives, sin, unbelief, that we could in fact see hope, the hope that's revealed through Jesus Christ. Jesus' righteousness, that we could draw close to that. And we have much of a continuation of that very thought this week. And, and so what we're going to say this morning is this. We need to be redeemed. That's a lot of what we talked about last week, but it continues into this week. We need to live redeemed. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to do both of those things, to move in that direction. John chapter, or Acts, not John. John was last week. Acts chapter 2 this week. I'd invite you to find Acts 2, and we'll read it in just a moment. Peter's going to tell us that we need to repent, we need to be baptized, and then that's how things are going to go. We live by the Spirit from those two movements. Um, I have been really dwelling on these news articles that have come out recently about the, uh, the Pew Research poll. I brought it up a couple weeks ago. Uh, that millennials are leaving the church faster than anticipated. Very interesting research. I think this was uh, timely research in many ways because uh, the main news outlet that, that I read it in kind of made it sound like this is the end of church. Uh, Christianity, this 2,000-year project, is now going to come to a close very soon because an entire generation is leaving the church. We should be very concerned about this, obviously. But it's not the end of Christianity. What's interesting is some other articles have come out since then that have talked about the fact that uh, if you parse these numbers a little bit, we're actually seeing perhaps a bit more definition of how we define Christian in the polling. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing much more of a post-Christian society, a secular society emerging at a faster rate. Um, having lived in Canada, I can tell you, I've lived in that. It's there. It's out there. We're seeing it start here or move that direction faster here. A great article that came out this week parsing the numbers uh, was entitled The End of Casual Christianity by Michael Gerson. I think that says a lot about what's this uh, uh, leaving of millennials and, in fact, many others, because it pointed out that if you look at the statistics, it's really among the Roman Catholic Church and mainline Protestant uh, denominations that you see the exit happening at such an alarming and fast rate. Among evangelicals, of which we fit in that category, it's, it's much slower, if not almost stable, in certain spots. And one of the interesting quotes that came out of that article, The End of Casual Christianity, was uh, a quote by the great historian George Marsden, who says, many denominations, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he says, many denominations have learned that it's difficult for the church to survive if there's nothing that makes the church distinct from culture. I think that's what stands behind some of these numbers. And that launches us right into a conversation about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit working in us. Of the need to be redeemed. Uh, if, if you want to put this in a different way, what we're going to talk about, biblical theologian N.T. Wright states it well. He says this, Those who follow Jesus are called to live by the rules of the new world. That's the kingdom of God. They're called to live by the rules of the new world rather than the old one. And the old one won't like it. It's a powerful statement. And I think that gets us right into the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
So let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. These are the words of Peter. He's preaching a sermon, and this is really at the end of his sermon. He has preached explaining uh, the resurrection, explaining what that means, why Jesus even came at all, explaining the moment of Pentecost. Beginning at verse 36, Peter says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's astounding church growth, by the way. 120 is what they started at. They went 3,120 in one day. That's the work of the Spirit right there. So Peter gives us a couple things to go on here. I mean, you could do a lot with these passages, believe me. Um, the, the literature is kind of endless on it. Peter says, though, repent. He starts there. They've been cut to the heart. He says, turn around. Or, or better yet, getting to the idea of repent, change your attitude. And that line, cut to the heart, is so interesting to me. That's what happened, and we have to remember what crowd he's talking to here. He's talking, as far as we can tell, primarily to a Jewish crowd, though not exclusively, but that's who he's addressing, people of Israel. He himself is Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. It's kind of an inner uh, dialogue at this point amongst the Jewish crowd, but they had just witnessed Pentecost. They had witnessed people speaking other languages so that others could now understand this message in a new way, in their own words. And they're, they're, at this point, they're, I think they're confused. There's a lot going on. What in the world happened? These guys look like they're drunk at nine in the morning. Peter says that doesn't happen at this hour. So what changed their thinking? Obviously, we can't fully get into their minds, but we can kind of get a glimpse right here of, of what's going on. They obviously saw something, and then they heard something that changed their thinking. Peter really defined some facts for them, especially if he's talking to people who knew the story, at least in some way, which it seems to be the assumption. Something interesting happens, and I'm going to throw a big word at you, and then we're going to not use it anymore because I just want you to get the idea, but what uh, they were presented with the facts. They had the facts. They obviously knew something about the story. But what was perhaps wrong is they had a faulty, here you go, hermeneutic. That's a fun word that gets used in seminaries all the time. The interpretive lens by which we see the facts or see scripture. Right? There are long classes on hermeneutics. It's a, it's a complicated topic. It just means interpretation, really. And so they had the facts. They had interpreted them a different way. They didn't know what was going on, and Peter says, let me, let me clue you in on how to connect the dots here. Let me give you a different way to see these modern day example of, of uh, how we could misinterpret things. Uh, every year, I have to take the cat in. I know you always love my cat stories. Every year, I have to take the cat in to go to the vet to get the yearly rabies shot and the checkup. And that's a day when I change my shirt after that because apparently cats shed more when they're nervous and so you're, you look like the cat when you're done you're coated in hair and so you take it into the vet you know you got a car ride which she doesn't like she goes into the vet and there's dogs in there for goodness sakes and even worse there's usually a cat in there oh that's worse right than the dogs and then she goes in and a couple of people grab and poke and prod and give her a shot this is a miserable experience for a cat and and so she interprets this like an animal would as the worst thing that could possibly happen. Well, it's actually a good thing, isn't it? I mean, we're preventing uh, the potential of rabies and other things and checking to make sure that she can still eat and do the normal cat things that she can do and sleep especially, which is the normal cat thing that she can do all day long. She has a different perspective. She has the wrong perspective, perhaps, on the right facts. Peter has done the same thing. He said, look, you've got some facts. Let me clue you in on how to connect the dots on what's going on. And so they have a changed perspective on the truth. 
And then they have a recognition of that very truth. And Peter says, this guy is Lord, he's our authority, and he's Messiah, the one who saves us both. That's who this Jesus was and is. And then they're cut to the heart. Peter says, repent. Further than that, Peter links this, he says, now be baptized. And by even mentioning that, I know with some of us, we walk into deep water or perhaps we are being sprinkled in light water at that point. Because baptism opens up a whole world of conversations and things that go on, right? What mode of baptism, those things immediately come up. Peter says, be baptized. Is it, well, does he mean immersion or sprinkling, infant believer, living water, standing water, cold water, warm water? The church has dissected this issue for a long time, divided and splitted and done all sorts of things. Splitted? That's not the right word. You can correct me later. But let's, let's make a connection even before we get into baptism. And that, again, is back to repentance to bring us to baptism. John Stott, in his commentary on Acts, makes a great statement about this repentance issue. He says, repentance and faith involve each other. The turn from sin being impossible without the turn to God and vice versa. Another way to say this, uh, the way I would state this often, and I think he's said it really well, is what's happening is a faith transfer when it comes to this repentance issue. It's not like the people believe in nothing before they turn. They believe in something. And so now they're transferring that faith over to something else. We do that. That's how faith works. And that's how repentance functions. So in many ways, the repentance part does a whole lot of stuff. When we repent, we make a lot of decisions in a very short period of time in some ways. But then baptism comes into play. Peter mentions baptism. And one of the things we have to look at is what does baptism do? I'm not going to give you all the answer to that because it's actually a really complex answer in my opinion. But here are a couple things that we can look at. Baptism puts us into full solidarity with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can read that in Romans 6. Paul says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. There's a change that's going on. We're entering into something by baptism, by dying and rising again. We can read in places like 1 Peter 3 or Acts 22 that there's a purifying or a cleansing component to baptism. Maybe that makes some of us uncomfortable, but that's what it says. You'll be cleansed from your sins, essentially, is what, what we read there. We are clothed through baptism. We can read that in Galatians 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. It's that new life we all of a sudden put on new clothes with that. We live into it. And then I think a neglected component far too often is that we become a covenant people through baptism. We're brought into the body of believers. It's like church membership in so many ways, not in the local sense, in the broad, worldwide body of Christ sense. And so you can look at 1 Corinthians 12 or Ephesians 4, which we'll see that text in a moment, and see that there's one body, and we're entered into that through baptism. We become a people, not just a person. And, and a question that we ask about baptism then is, is baptism simply something we do, or is it something God does? I think the answer actually is, is somewhere in between there because I think baptism really is a promise. And we are making a promise, but God is making a promise to us through baptism. I think that's what's going on. And so let's look at these two things a little deeper, what Peter has told us to do. He said repent. Really, in, in essence, all we need is an attitude adjustment. That's how to state this. I think repent is the response of the redeemed. People who recognize what's being held out through Jesus Christ. Redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Second week in a row we've seen it because it's that good. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, we read, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I haven't gotten one of these in a while, but have you gotten those publishers clearinghouse checks ever? They say you've won a million dollars. 
How many winners in the room? You get those in the mail, and of course there's a tremendous amount of fine print after the check that you get that you've won a million dollars. But here's the thing. We're essentially being told right here, you've won. It's, you've got a check that just needs to be signed over, endorsed, however you want to say it. He's, he's already, Jesus has already done the work. Now we need to enter into the redemption part of it. You've already been redeemed. And if we look back at Acts 2, the crowd responds to this kind of word. They have a changed perspective, we said. They have a recognition of the truth that something has happened through Jesus Christ. He's Lord and Messiah, and something occurred, and they need to repent and be baptized. They have had an affected conscience when they're cut to the heart. Something needs to be different. So we looked at this last week. We need to expose sin. We need to lay before God the stuff that would hold us back, hold us away, blind us from what God is doing. Lay it out there. We must recognize those things and turn them over for redemption. The redemption that's already held out for us. And we need to recognize that God is at work. God is at work around us, and God is at work even when we don't recognize that God is at work. There was a redemption that was going on well before we were born, and we're invited to join into that, to be redeemed. Repent, Peter says. The second thing is I want to talk about baptism for just a little bit. Because repentance, we've said, is it's kind of that entrance. Peter links baptism to that. And I think it's not just the attitude adjustment we need. It's the life change that comes with it. And I think that's what baptism brings us into. Baptism brings us to that point of the promise of new life. There are three claims that we could put on baptism. Baptism says... My life belongs to Jesus Christ. This is a lot like this first or second Corinthians passage we read that redemption is already out there. But if you look at the language that Peter uses, once they've been cut to the heart, he says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, by saying that, he's not saying, well, now we no longer baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's not at all what he's saying, actually. Names are powerful, perhaps in the ancient world more than, more than now. Names were very powerful. Many of you in the room actually have known me for my entire life, uh, and many of you knew me as a different name, Andrew, my first name. I switched at 18, so now I've done half of my life as one name, half as the other, uh, 18 and 18, uh, as Andrew, then to Evan. There's a shift that goes on when you shift your names or change your name, and, and perhaps this has happened when some of you have gotten married and you've changed your last name. There's an identity shift that's going on. When we read in the name of, this is really just banking language from the ancient world. In a lot of ways, this is the sign the check over language, or sign the deed over of the house. To be redeemed in this case is to say, okay, when I repent, when I'm baptized, I'm signing myself over in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what's going on. It is no longer my life. Jesus really is Lord. He's really authority over me at this point. That's what's really happening. We're giving our life over. So baptism says my life belongs to Jesus. Baptism says this story is bigger than me. I think that's a very important point that's forgotten in baptism as well. Go back to verse 39. Peter said... The promise, this promise of the, the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those two gifts we read about. The promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off. This gets us into, uh, for you and your children, largely if he's speaking to Israel, as he says, people of Israel, those who are on the in crowd, it's for you folks. But then he says to those who are far off, all of a sudden it gets into, well, us, Gentile territory. Those who, who wouldn't have been immediately included, so to speak, in the first, in, as the covenant people. The story is bigger. It's passed down. It's not just about me making a decision to enter into new life with Jesus Christ. It's about me entering in with a people, which we'll get to in a moment. And we enter that story by repentance and baptism. And we know that as we do that, there's a bigger story in the world around us but we're entering into a different story. 
Uh, there's a, a brilliant Christian ethics book by Samuel Wells where he, he talks about the church's story, and he says this. He says, The church does not simply accept the story of evil, a story of something that's trying to tear apart what God is doing. It has a story of its own. The church's story begins before evil began and ends after evil has ended. There's a different story that we walk into upon that redemption and upon that baptism. Something God is up to and invites us into, to be a part of. That's a big thing. If we look at a snapshot then of of sort of this uh, different set of rules we live by as we read from the beginning, uh, we can look at the words of Jesus, right? Jesus says things like, don't murder. You've heard that said. Well, I tell you, don't even be angry at your brother. Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I tell you, don't even lust after someone. Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. I tell you, love even your enemy. We could say it in other ways. You've heard it said, while you're at work, don't badmouth your coworkers. Think well of them, even the ones that are annoying. You've heard it said, don't push people to the margins just because you don't like them. Love them. You've heard it said, even when people want the worst for you, no matter where you are, pray for them like you want the best for them. It's a different set of rules. It's a different story we've entered into. Somebody different rules our lives, and we operate in a different way because of that. Living by the Spirit means we are entered into this bigger story, but living by the Spirit means we're given the power to live the story, even when it's not easy. Third claim of baptism, it says, My life is lived with those whom Jesus has redeemed. So I belong to Jesus, the story is bigger than me, and I live it with you people. That's the claim. Of course, we enter into that big story of the church, the body of Christ, worldwide, but we live it out in the local church, the local context, just like you've chosen today. Paul says in Ephesians 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. He says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There's just one body. That's all we're baptized into. It's not just a visual aid of a historical decision that we made at one point to accept Jesus Christ and now I'm going to get wet. It's something deeper than that. We're entering into something much bigger than that through baptism. And you cannot, you cannot, you cannot live the story alone. The baptized, redeemed life in Jesus Christ is to be lived with other people who are doing the same thing. There are two promises in the text, forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, Peter says, for forgiveness, that's being offered, and the power of the Holy Spirit to live it out, to be the redeemed, and to stay that way. We have a new set of rules that we're being offered, and we have the power to live it out. Those, those articles are so interesting and so instructive. I, I talked about it at the beginning. I think they're telling us a lot about the world we're in right now. I think we're in an age, perhaps, of honesty, about who's claiming Jesus Christ and who's not. About For for years, people checked off that I'm a Christian because they weren't the other things on the list. And now more and more people have checked off I'm nothing. I don't know that this signals the end of a lot of things. What it signals is that as we live the new life, there are more people that can be drawn to the new life. And by the power of the Spirit... We have that commission to go and do it. We have the power to live out our baptism, to live it out well with the people God has placed us with, to bring others in, to make the family bigger, to allow more people to recognize the redemption that's being offered through Jesus Christ. And so two questions that we can ask ourselves as we close this out is, uh, what areas of your life still need to be redeemed? For some of us, we've, we've accepted the redemption a long time ago, but i got to tell you, there are many areas in life that still, it seems like it takes them longer 
for that redemption, to truly hand them over to Jesus and say it's yours. What areas still need to be redeemed in your own life? And, and perhaps you're sitting here and you say, I've never asked for any of that. Maybe this is a morning where you, in fact, say, Jesus, I want the redemption. I know it's being offered. I've never asked. Bring me in on that story. Help me repent and be made new. The second question is, how are you living your baptism? And again, for some people I know, many in the room have been baptized. Some haven't. So for some, it might be, well, is this the time? Maybe that's a great question to ask. And for others, I think those commitments, we certainly didn't exhaust the topic of baptism this morning. It's a a deep topic. Um, But how are you living it out? Are you living it out in the presence of others? Are you living it out by the power of the Spirit? Is that new set of rules working out or not in that new life? Those are good questions we have to ask ourselves constantly. Because somebody is always trying to pull us away from these things and pull us away from the redemption. Pull us away from the life of baptism we're supposed to be living. As you consider these questions, I want to take a moment to pray again. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. And I really ask God what needs to be redeemed in your life. If you've never asked Jesus in or have never asked for that redemption, take time now. If there are areas that need to be redeemed, ask for that redemption now. Hand over those parts that you still hold that you can live life fully in Jesus. God, be with us as we live out baptism, as we live out new life in you, as we continue to understand what redemption in your name, handing ourselves over fully and completely means. When we do hold things back, send your Holy Spirit in our lives to give us the courage to hand it over, to help us see what's on the other side of handing those things over, that we would live fully into you, that it would be new life and not just the old life with fresh paint. God, help us live that new life in you. Recognize the work of your spirit. God, may your spirit go before us this week to empower us to live this life, to be made new, to bring others in to your family. Bring those conversations to us Give us the words when they come. God, we pray that all in the name of your Son, Jesus, who loved us so much, who gave us the Holy Spirit. Amen.